that everyone in this room is thinking about today. It's not our sins. It's bagels. <laughs> Whitefish, Nova, cream cheese, however you take it. We can be honest here. For a day that we don't eat, we spend a lot of time thinking about food. And while Yom Kippur has many traditions and customs, the one that seems to get the most airtime is fasting. We joke about how long we'll be able to make it, we lament our caffeine headaches, and we plan and plot our strategy for that first bite of food when we enter our breakfast. It's true. Now, the practice of fasting is first found in Leviticus, where we read that any person who does not practice self-denial shall be cut off from his people. This self-denial has come to mean five things. Eating, drinking, bathing and anointing, sexual relations, and wearing leather shoes. While all are traditionally prohibited on this day, not eating is the one that most Jews of all denominations observe. And it's also, at least I think, the most misunderstood. Some say it is a form of self-punishment that we should suffer when we fast, or that it is a way to show God just how sorry we are for our sins. The hungrier we are, the more we resist food, the more likely we will be written into the Book of Life. Neither is true. Nor is a person viewed by God as more righteous or holy or good because they fast. Fasting is personal. One is never supposed to inquire about another person's fasting, and this one's big, nor comment if we happen to see someone eating on this day. Fasting is only a mitzvah for those over bar and bat mitzvah age. Now we can split hairs here. Is it 13 years or once you've actually read from the Torah? Every year I hear our teenagers intensely discussing this, wanting to trade bar and bat mitzvah dates, like they're trading players for their fantasy leagues. Many groups of, children, many groups of people, though, should not fast. Younger children, those who are pregnant or nursing, people with chronic illnesses, and just to set the record straight, our pets never have to fast. But for those who can, fasting is one of the ways that today is different from all other Jewish days. In refraining from food, we may be able to heighten our religious experience, to rise above our physical needs, to try and take stock of the spiritual and emotional. I believe that fasting gives us the opportunity and puts us in the right mindset to think intellectually about food and ultimately about hunger. What is it that we want to consume? What fills us up in life? What is it that we need to metabolize? It also helps us think about the idea that for most of us, Food is very, very complicated. It is not only on Yom Kippur that we Jews are obsessed with eating. Food has been part of our history since the beginning of time, a strand woven through our collective DNA. Our Torah is full of references. We first ate only vegetation in the Garden of Eden. Then we were permitted to eat meat after the flood that saved Noah and his family. As a disparate group of Israelites wandering in the desert, food became a central source of anxiety and of comfort. We ate manna from heaven, and we learned the laws of kashrut. You see, we, food and Jews, we go together like pastrami and rye bread. For us and for every other ethnic and religious group, food is so much more than nourishment. It is language, culture, currency, and memory. Food is the way we celebrate and the way we mourn. Can you think of one life cycle event or holiday meal that doesn't include the big festive meal? We have boiling pots of matzo ball soup, 
Our ovens are stuffed full of brisket and kasha and kugel and simis. We bake challah for Shabbat. We arrange our Seder plates with symbolic foods. We fry latkes and fold hamantaschen. We send cookies to the Shiva house. And we spell out the name of a young person in bread at a bar mitzvah. Everywhere you look in the Jewish world, we are either thinking about food, cooking, or eating. Now this mindset of food abundance is counterintuitive, since for most of our history, we Jews have been hungry. We stole bread in the ghettos, and we made a pot of soup last for a week in the tenement houses. Today, we do not have to steal dinner rolls or packets of sweet and low. We have reached a point in our history where most of us have plenty to eat. And yet the stereotype rings true. We Jews cannot have just enough food. We always have to have extra. The lingering legacy of our food insecurity. Now I say all of this with a grain of salt, kosher salt, that is, because we know that there are many, many hungry people in our world. 41 million Americans struggle with hunger. In New Jersey, 11% of families don't have enough to eat. The Interfaith Food Pantry of the Oranges provides 275 clients each week with groceries. That's 800 individuals, 40% of whom are children. This year, so far, they have helped feed 7,000 households, which is equivalent to feeding every single house in Milburn and Short Hills. At TBJ, through our Tikkun Olam Committee, we collect food this time of year and all year long because we believe it is fundamental that no one should ever be hungry. But for all our desire to feed those in need, we may end up nourishing everyone but ourselves. The writer, Jonathan Safran Foyer, recounts a memory of visiting his grandmother for the weekend. On my way in on Friday night, she would lift me from the ground in one of her fire-smothering hugs. And on the way out, Sunday afternoon, I was again taken into the air. It wasn't until years later that I realized she was weighing me. <laughs> it is impossible to talk about food without acknowledging its weight and the often painful dissonance between what we eat and how we feel about our bodies and ourselves. On a rational level, we know that food is merely the caloric intake we need to expel the energy to live each day putting gas in the tank of life. But I hardly know anyone for whom it is that simple. As a rabbinic intern, in my very first role here at B'nai Jeshurun, I taught a class every Monday night entitled Girl Power, in which I sat with a dozen teenage girls to talk about their life. Parents, pressure, school, who liked who. Now before class, we had dinner, and I had a decision to make. I would be hungry, but I wasn't so sure if I should eat the pizza that we served. You see, on one hand, I think about our teenage girls, my opportunity to be a role model for them. And plus, pizza's delicious. So I'd pick up a slice. And then I would think about myself, my body. I'd worry that it didn't look the way I wanted or the way other people told me it should. And sometimes I'd put the slice back down. Other times, I would just show up too late to eat, or I'd bring my own food. But I would still worry that I was giving the wrong and unconscious clues to my students. No matter what I did, I would end up feeling like I had made the wrong decision. Like many of us, I'm sure, I find the ownership of a physical body to be both difficult and confusing. Not a day goes by that the onslaught of print and social media doesn't fill our heads and news feeds, the magazines we read, with all of these myths' truths. Dieting is normal. 
Food, if not controlled, is dangerous. The size of your genes is the direct measure of your worth in this world. So many of you have shared how difficult these thoughts are to remove from your mental loop once you've heard them, and gosh, I know it too. Debating over the ragal oneg, the bagel at a kiddish, choosing between fries and salad at lunch, what foods are good and which ones are bad, what is enough, how much should we eat, the ongoing math problem in your head, what I've eaten today, what have I eaten this week, what meals are coming up, caught in the unending cycle of fasting and feasting, depriving and indulging, with so much food noise rattling around in our heads, it can make it impossible to hear anything clearly. When I was growing up, carbs were good and fat was bad. Pop-tarts were breakfast and no one I know ate kale. <laughs> Today, though, figuring out what to eat is almost a full-time job. We can become nearly obsessed taking perfect pictures of our meals to post on social media, watching those cooking videos online in the Food Network. We can become a master griller, known for our best foods. My favorite is that French toast casserole. But it's not hard to move from the casual interest to the extreme. In our country, 20 million women and 10 million men suffer from eating disorders, with Jews being diagnosed at a higher rate when compared to the general populations. Now, we can often turn conversations about food into a joke, but eating disorders are extremely serious. Those who have symptoms often do not seek treatment because of social stigma. Not everyone who has an eating disorder looks like they do because they can afflict people in any body shape or size. And terrifyingly, eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of all mental illnesses. I know how personal this is for some people sitting in the sanctuary today. But as your rabbi, I believe that our synagogues have to be the places where we talk about the hard things. So if you or someone you know is in need of help or is struggling or just wants to talk, your clergy are here for you. We are a safe and confidential place to turn. But it's also my hope that we won't be afraid to engage in an ongoing and honest conversation about how we relate to food on a spiritual and personal level since we're thinking about it all the time, since we're talking about it all the time, is there a better place than right here, right now on this day when we're not eating, to begin that conversation? So let's talk about another hard thing. There are many of us who live in the middle, without diagnosis, but who at times have a disordered way of thinking about food and eating. We cleanse, existing on liquids for days at a time. We detox, eliminating certain food groups from our diets. We limit, counting and measuring every bite. We binge, using food to numb, repress emotion or ignore problems. We read, looking for the next book that will have the magic cure. We try all kinds of eating plans. Vegan, keto, gluten-free, paleo, Whole30, F-Factor, Weight Watchers, or we just eat healthy. There's now a word for this, orthorexia, to describe those who have an obsession with healthy eating, a compulsion to only eat clean and pure foods. There are so many good reasons to think about what we eat, to fuel ourselves in order to keep our bodies healthy and fit, to eat what makes us feel good, and to eat food that is delicious. But we human beings are so good at taking things just a little too far for the sake 
of achievement and of excellence. It's often said that a rabbi only gives one sermon in their lifetime. You've heard me talk about it generally and personally, so I bet you know what I'm going to say next. But I believe that we can draw a straight line between food in all of its complexities and perfection. In our deep desire to control and perfect, food becomes an easy tool. In becoming perfect when it comes to eating, we can distance ourselves from the parts of our life that are anything but. No matter our relationship with eating, no matter if we are fasting today, all of us live in a world that both glorifies food and sets strict social standards about what is good and acceptable. It would be so easy for me to say now that it's only your essence that's important. If you just take care of the spiritual, the physical will follow. But come on, we live in the real world. We walk around every day in our mortal bodies. We see and we experience the ways that food and movement affect them. But as much as we try and guard the outside, those sacred vessels, let's not forget about what those vessels contain. And that is our souls, the part of us that is as beautiful and pure and unblemished as the day we were born, the part of us that doesn't need to eat less or more or better, the part of us that is perfect as is. An old grandfather is teaching his grandson about life. A terrible fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is between two wolves. One is evil, anger and envy, superiority and ego. The other is good, peace and love and empathy and hope. That same fight is going on within you and every person you know. The grandson thought about it for a moment and then asked, well, Grandpa, which one's going to win? And the old man simply replied, the one you feed. What are we feeding ourselves today? Not talking about the bagels anymore. Because we have those wolves inside of us too. No matter what we eat, we're feeding one of them. We choose which one we feed by the way we talk about other people, the names we call ourselves, the ways we judge and evaluate the people we know and the people we don't, the person sitting alone at a restaurant, the face on the cover of the magazine. We choose by the way in which we feed ourselves that can either leave us feeling empty or nourished. I don't know if it's possible to replace that loop in our heads, so let's try to add to it. Words of affirmation and love, words that this body of ours was a gift from our creator on the day we were born. And no matter how hard we try to edit or shape or master it, it's not going to last forever. So let's honor it. Let's honor its strength and its softness. Let's honor, honor the ways in which it's carried us, its resilience and endurance, the babies it's grown, the illnesses and injuries it survived. Even when our fast comes to an end, let's, let's stop hurting ourselves for the sake of a perfect ideal. None of us are better or worse because of what we eat. None of us will be written into the book of life because we fasted. And every single one of us deserves to feel full, not only because we eat, but because something deep inside us has been satiated. What are you hungry for? What are you feeding yourself? How is it that we reconcile these beautifully imperfect bodies with the luminous nature of our perfect souls? Today, I won't wish you an easy fast or even a meaningful fast, but I will wish you a fast of wholeness, 
May that fast bring us closer to the truth in our lives, the balance we all deserve, and perhaps some peace within ourselves. Shana Tovah.